lads, I'd just like to say thanks to everybody uh, for coming into the talk. Um, big well done to all the lads who have organised such a great event today. The place looks really good, really good vendors and whatnot outside. And um, it's just a great lineup and a great opportunity for coaches to come together and to, to pick things up from each other. You know, I always find that these kind of talks, you might, you might not learn something from me today. It might, you might be the person you're sitting next to or maybe with the lads in the panel discussion later or someone asks an important question that you think, yeah, you know what I mean? So there's great learning opportunities in, in sessions like this. Uh, so my name is Jay Welsh. Uh, I'm going to run you through today an evidence-based performance approach to, to warming up, all right, and maybe try change your philosophies and your methods towards your warm-ups. Um, a little bit about my background, I'm from Waterford, I live in Waterford, I have a Bachelor of Science in Sports Coaching and Performance through WIT and I'm currently completing my MSc in Sports and Exercise Psychology. Uh, I'm accredited CSCS through the NSCA and I'm accredited with the UK SCA in terms of strength and condition. Um, the first thing I want to touch on, okay, is building buy-in. Okay, so building buy-in. So you can come around away from today's session and you can be like, you know what, that's the warm-up I'm going to use. I'm taking that back to the lads now. I'm taking that back to the girls. New warm-up strategies. Take it from me, and I'm sure any of the coaches in the room, the most important thing a coach can have is buy-in with the players. So you leave here today and you have a new method that you're going to use, hopefully, for your warm-ups. If your players don't buy into those new methods, you've lost straight away. Uh, I've suffered from this in the past. Um, I started working with a League of Ireland football club before uh, in the academy. The very first thing I done when I wanted to change the warm ups is I brought in our minivan work, so our activation work. Went out, we got about 1 0 off Shelburne. Manager comes over, gives me an absolute bollocking. What's the story with those minivans? They're useless, don't use those again. They're, that's the reason why we got bet today. Of course, that's not the reason we got bet. We got bet because the ball went into the goal. But you see, I, I didn't have buy-in with the players and I didn't have buy-in with the coach into why I was using those minivans or why we were doing this particular sort of warm-up. So if you can learn from my mistakes, that's definitely one. So uh, in terms of building buy-in, it's really important that you explain the why. So as a coach, everybody here, if you're working with any groups, any athletes, you're an educator, okay? So you don't have to explain every single last detail behind what you're doing. But if you can explain a little bit of the why behind your methods, you're going to have a bigger buy-in to your philosophies and why you're doing this, okay? So again, if you're bringing a new warm-up back to the clubs or anything like that, explain why you're doing it. Um, also, really important to empower the players. So buy-in takes a bit of time. So as a coach, of course, you're a leader. You're going to have to be a bit hands-on when you're trying to change things up, especially with warm-ups and whatnot. But as you start to develop that little bit of buy-in, be okay with kind of taking a step back and starting to empower your players. I'll always see it like some of the great sporting organisations in the world, the coaches don't take the warm-ups. You'll have senior player, you'll have one of the captains, you never know, you might have an up and coming player. And that's a really good sign that you have buy-in from your athletes. Your athletes trust your methods, they trust what you're doing. Take a step back and you know, there's probably more important things for you to be doing if, if you're not lucky enough to have an athletic performance coach or a strength and conditioning coach, you probably have more important things to do. So if you can give a little bit of empowerment when you start to change these methods, uh, it'll definitely help embrace the change. Uh, probably the best book I've ever wrote, uh, read on buy-in is Conscious Coaching by Brett Bartholomew. Um, that's an absolute must read for any coach. Uh, really good, just practical based stuff on how to get your players to buy into what you're doing a little bit more. Uh, so, what you actually came here to listen to, uh, the warm-up, alright, so warm-ups typically have to serve four main primary uh, purposes. So a good, well-designed warm-up should tick the boxes on mental preparedness, physical preparedness, injury prevention, and then performance enhancement. So actually getting the players a little bit better every time we warm up. So, the reason warm-ups have kind of changed over the past maybe decade or so and they're still evolving with new methods coming out is to tick these four boxes as as opposed to just be thinking we're just warming up we're, we're, we're warming up how many times have we went out onto the pitch and we've delivered a warm-up and it's oh, we're just getting warm getting warm real quick there you've 10 minutes now getting warm like the players don't need to physically get warm as such you know they're trying to tick the boxes on these four um so Warm-ups commonly, I don't know, from my experience, last from about 10 to 15 minutes, give or take. I think 
anything over that can get a little bit uh, too complicated. Um, so each session is short over a 12 week cycle. The accumulation of a 10 to 15 minute warm up leads to a huge increase in training time. So if we're doing, let's just agree that we're all doing a 15 minute warm up, okay? 15 minute warm up, four times a week, be that three training sessions and one match at the weekend. That's 12 hours of total training time that we can spend developing kind of movement capacities. We can enhance injury prevention as opposed to just doing 12 hours of just warming up for the sake of warming up so if if you were to get with your clubs 12 hours of of skill practice or if you were to get 12 hours with an snc coach or 12 hours with a fitness coach whatever it is you would value those 12 hours so you can kind of see how the warm-up should take a little bit more value in your plans too uh, really good from kevin goyles here he says warm-up 10 to 15 minutes an athlete can do 300 plus movements, so just cyclical movements, moving up and down the pitch, whatever it is. Two times a week is 600 movements, eight per month, 2,400. 10 months is 24,000 movements. And he concludes with, as you sure, that two laps of jogging the pitch and static stretching is a good use of our time. Why waste all these movement learning opportunities? So back to that four sessions a week, 15 minute warm up. that's 12 hours where we can actually start looking to enhance uh, movement capacities and uh, prevent injury. Um, so where warm-ups are kind of moving to, and if you don't take anything from me today, just take this part, okay? Is it short-term preparation or is it long-term development? So again, are, are we doing the warm-up literally just to prepare them for the particular training session? Or are we doing the warm-up just because like we've always done warm-ups let's just tick the boxes everybody does a warm-up before we play a match everybody does a warm-up for the training session so we need to look beyond the warm-up as simply a short-term preparation warm-up should be an integrated part of every training session systematically planned out to enhance athletic performance so the same way that if we're lucky enough to work with strength and conditioning coaches and fitness coaches, we're going to have some sort of plan in place over the next, be it 12 weeks or eight weeks, where we're going to try to develop, be it strength, power, aerobic capacity, or we're working with a skills coach. And over those next 12 weeks, we're going to develop whatever specific skills we're using. The warm up is the exact same kind of learning opportunities. There is a lot of time to start developing things. So warm up should be done acutely so on the short term to physically prepare them for what they're about to do but they should also be done to thinking about fitting into your long-term development plan and what you can actually do in those warm-ups um happy enough so far if, if at any stage you want me to go back on a slide lads or, or throw any questions out there uh, feel free to do um we've all been to kind of discussions and seminars where so but it's just talking and talking and talking but i think you learn more when you start getting a little bit of discussion in uh so the ramp method okay so ian jeffrey's really popular snc coach um who has developed what's called a ramp method is anyone familiar to the ramp method or we've used it before ramp is basically just an acronym okay so like I said before, we're not just warming up for the sake of it. We're now looking at a systematic process. So RAMP gives us a really, really easy to follow systematic process that anyone in this room can write those four letters down leaving here today and they can design a perfect warm up. Okay? You don't need to be a strength and conditioning coach or a fitness coach or have any sports science background to design a good warm up. Uh, so Ian Jeffries in 2006 came up with the RAMP method. So the R stands for raise. So that's the first part of our warm up. We're looking to raise our core temperature, get the heart rate up, get the blood flowing, uh, increase joint viscosity and whatnot. Uh, and that's done via low intensity activity. So this is our straight line running, our lateral shuffles, our you know, hops, bounds and skips, our very simple start of our warm up, which I don't know if anyone disagrees with me. I think most warm ups do start that way where we're moving up and down the pitch. Nothing is too intense yet, nothing is too technical. From there, then we move into our second phase, which is the A, and that's our activation phase. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to activate key muscle groups specific to the sport in action. The reason I do always say specific to the sport in action is, if we're trying to activate key muscle groups, 
for a hurler or a camogie player, that's going to be a little bit different from a shot putter or a discus thrower. There's going to be different muscle groups, so it has to be specific to what you're actually going to do on the pitch. Uh, the second part then we have our M, which is going to be our mobilise. So we're going to again mobilise key joints, so ankles, knees, hips, spine, shoulders. Uh, again, specific to the sporting range of motions that we're about to undertake. So if, again, what mobility work a tennis player does compared to a Gaelic footballer is going to be very different. And then the last part, which when the ramp mate at first came out, it was referred to as potentiate. So potentiation is basically doing a certain thing to now look for a further effect. I like to call it performance, okay? The last part of the warm up should be as close to the skill that you're about to undertake as possible. So if you're about to go out onto a hurling pitch, you're going to sprint, you're going to accelerate, you're going to cut, you're going to change direction, you're going to jump. Well then our last part of our warm up should include those things, okay? And I'm gonna to touch into each one of them individually now in a second. If anyone wants to take pictures or write notes and I skip past it, just let me know and I'll go straight back to it, okay? So, phase one of our warm-up. We begin our warm-up, okay? We're using the ramp method, okay? So R stands for raise. So the aim of this phase is to increase our heart rate, increase our body temperature, our respiration rate, our blood flow, and our joint viscosity, okay? They're the physiological things behind getting warm, okay? As, as coaches, we don't really need to worry about that. If, if I run up, if I do four laps of here, I'd probably take the boxes on all those, all right? What, what this phase is really good for is developing moving patterns. So this is a chance, if you're, if you're lucky enough to work with some good kind of athletic development coaches, is here's where you can maybe start improving on your running mechanics. Here's where you can start improving on jump mechanics. Here's where, as opposed to just getting warm by saying, right, lap of the pitch, Maybe you can now start looking at side running, backpedaling. We can start looking at changing the intensity of the running. Um, what some, I don't know if anybody will shout out, but what do we normally do as coaches in this phase, in, in the raise phase? Anyone have stuff that they do? Jogging up and down the pitch and whatnot? Yeah? So straight line running. So literally we have our cones set up, whatever way, it's so individual. Straight line running, we have our lateral movements. Change of direction running, change of intensity running, hop, skips, and bounds. Okay, that's normally what your raise phase is going to be made up of. This is just what I make them up of. What you make them up of can be entirely different. Who knows, you might have players cycling up and down the pitch for all you know, as long as it gets the job done. Uh, the raise phase then approximately should last about five minutes. Okay, if you're lucky enough to have that 15 minutes given to you by your coach to warm up. Happy enough with the raise phase? Okay, so we've done our five minutes, we've got the heart rate up, we've got the blood flowing. We're now into phase two, which is going to be our activation phase. Okay, so a key problem I see with the next two phases is what a lot of coaches do is they go through the raise phase, they get the players warm, they get them going, starting to kind of get a little bit ramped up, and then they stop and they start moving into static stretching. Or maybe they're down on the floor and they're doing exercises. You've kind of defeated the purpose of doing the raise phase. So what was the point in getting them up and down the pitch and getting the heart rate up and getting them going if now you're going to sit down on the ground, we're going to start stretching the quads and we're going to start doing some partner stretches. In these next two phases, if you change one thing in your warm-up, just try keeping dynamic. You can still, I, I'm using, I'll, I'll use the simplest warm-up ever and it works. My two banks of cones, my raise phase is done between the cones. My activation exercises are now done between the cones. Those players will not stop in the 15 minutes. So the aim of the activation phase then is to activate key muscle groups specific to the sport and action using kind of prehab type exercises. So be it like your calf raises, your quad pulls, stuff that's going to kind of start getting those key areas and key muscle groups ready. Um, things that we use in the activation phase Dynamic movements, as I said, it must be dynamic. There's, there's no point in warming them up if we've now taken it back down to static stretching. Body weight resistant exercises, it can be lunges, it can be squats, it can be push-ups, it can be anything you want. Mini band movements, unless like me, you get a bollocken and you're never allowed to use mini bands again, all right? Um, do we use mini bands in our warm-ups, you know, our kind of resistance exercises? 
I, I like using those on the pitch, provided, again, we have that buy-in from our players. I personally think mini band exercises should be done pre-warm-up, so in the dressing room. Players are arriving 10, 15 minutes before the warm-up, whatever your individual situation is, that's probably a better time to start getting the mini band work in. Okay? Uh, you're going to have core movements, you're going to have balance movements, stability movements. Sorry, just... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't even have one with me, but a mini band movement is you ever see like our kind of Dyna bands almost. It's like a little kind of elastic type band that would go around my knees and you'd see a player doing kind of monster walks, adductions to the side and whatnot. Familiar with them, no? Um, I, can, I'll, I don't have it in this particular warm up, but I can post a video on it. They're, they're very, if you're not using them at the moment, you're not going to revolutionize your warm-ups by, by bringing them in, but they are becoming quite popular, especially with field sports and whatnot. They're basically just like a little bit of elastic band is what they are. Um, that phase, approximately three minutes is all it should take, okay? So you move on to your third phase then, and we have our M, and we're going into our mobility work. So think of this as kind of like, again, it, this is the phase where people start bringing the players onto the ground, they start holding on to each other and doing static stretching, which I'm not going to get too much into the science of it, but it really does hinder performance before a match. So what we're trying to do is mobilize key joints and specific range of motions. So for our field players, again, it must be dynamic movements. We want to get the ankles, the knees, the hips, the spine, and the shoulders all looked after, okay? In, in GAA, I would probably prioritize the lower body movements more so than the upper body, but a good warm-up will include all of it, all right? I have a practical example that I'm going to show you when I get through this, so hopefully these phases will start making a little bit of sense. Uh, again, approximately three minutes. Happy enough? Mobility phase? The final phase then, all right, which is probably the most important phase, all right, because this is the phase where we're now trying to get as close to what we're going to do on the pitch as possible. All right, so this phase has been called the potentiation phase. I just rather call it the performance phase. Okay, so the aim of the performance phase is to prime the athletes for the specific sport and actions they're about to engage in. Okay, and it's to increase the intensity to the competitive intensity. So there's no point in finishing out the last bit of your warm up and you're still just kind of going through the motions. If you're going to get out onto the pitch, then and the first thing normally what's going to happen is a player is going to hit an acceleration or they're going to hit a fast sprint. And if you've not done your accelerations and your fast sprints and your warm-up, chances are you're hitting an injury. How many people have had a player go out and get injured, hamstring injury normally, straight away in a match? Probably because the end of the warm-up is a little bit insufficient. So in this phase, what we want to do, and I'll touch on how to kind of design your warm-up later on, is we're going to accelerate when we get out onto that pitch. All right, so we should be doing some accelerations, sharp 10 meter bursts, whatever way you want to do it. We're going to be sprinting when we get out onto that pitch. So we need to be doing some type of sprinting towards the end of a warm up. We're going to be jumping on two legs, on one leg. We're going to be bounding, we're going to be hopping. So we need to get our plyometric drills in. Plyometric is really any form of jumping, two legs, single leg that we're going to be doing. Looking example, and I'm hoping the video will play. Now, and it's not from GAA, it's from rugby. And I know you might be thinking, oh, I didn't even come here to learn what rugby players do. You can learn more from watching other sports than you can watching your own sports. Check out what the best teams in the world do and, and realize that it's actually quite simple. Okay, so with everything I've said, have a quick look at this video and I'll skip through it as we go and see if you can identify some of the things that are going on. So the early stages of our warm-up, they're moving very, very simply between some cones. Okay, it doesn't take a lot of creativity. This is a raise phase. They're running in straight lines. They're changing directions. They're increasing the intensity of the runs. Okay, so that's a raise phase. Notice as they're going through it, they, they move from just doing simple straight line runs to footwork stuff, lateral movements change of intensity, change of direction, okay? Um, as the video begins to progress then, we're gonna move into our, 
was this? So we're now moving into our activation stage. Okay, activating key muscle groups, but look how dynamic it is. Even though the players have now come down onto the floor, they don't stop moving. Okay, I don't really think if I'm gonna be lying on the floor doing this, my heart rate is gonna start coming down. I'm still keeping it high. Into our mobility phase, activation phase, some more mobility. And now, get as specific as to what's about to happen on the pitch as we can. We move into our potentiation phase. Some short accelerations, some sprints. Getting the players primed and ready. So that if any of those players are to go out onto the pitch and the first thing that they have to do is an acceleration or a sprint, they've done it in the warm up. They're actually ready to go. And then, like I said, very individually based, they move into some game-based activities then. That's entirely up to you. Some teams like to go and do a little bit. Other teams just like to get into dressing room. Maybe you don't actually have the time to go. Okay, so with all that in mind now, you're probably saying, you know, it's very easy for me to stand up and say, oh, that's very simple. And I know it's not simple, but... How do we actually design our warm up? So, design your warm up to match whatever it is your players are doing on the pitch. Okay? You do that via what's called a needs analysis. Okay? So, again, if we're lucky to have strength and conditioning coaches and athletic directors and whatnot, we'll have someone to do this for us. But again, we can do it. Biomechanical, physiological, and injury risk. All right? Sounds a bit complicated, it's actually not too much. So I'm thinking, I'm working with my group of players, right? Let's just say a group of Gaelic footballers. What, what are the main sporting movements that they're doing? Well, they're running, they're accelerating, they're sprinting, they're jumping. So my warm-up needs to include some of that. Jo what joint actions are they using? Predominantly lower body, ankles, knees, and hips. So in my warm-up, I need to take care of the ankles, knees, and hips. What speeds and forces and velocities and time are they doing? No, they're doing short bursts of explosive sprints. So my warm-up needs to include some, some form of short accelerations and sprints, all right? The physiological stuff then, you know, if you're lucky enough, top level, you're working with GPS kind of companies and that, you have all this. What's the heart rate? What's the energy systems? What total distance do they run in the match? How many sprints do they do? How much high-intensity running do they do? If I start to know that, you don't need GPS to do that. You can just observe the game then I know how intense my warm-up should be. So you're going out, and you're playing a really, really intense competitive match. Maybe that warm-up needs to be a little bit more up. And then your injury risk. So when it comes to our prehab stuff, let's just say we have five players who have done a little bit of damage to their hips, then maybe we should start having some hip work in. Um, we have players that are suffering, our physios told us they're suffering weak glutes, inactive glutes. So we're gonna have some glute work in there. Um, happy enough, you see how basically what you're trying to do is you're not designing a warm-up just for the sake of designing a warm-up. You're designing a warm-up to meet your team, to meet your demands, and it could be a different warm-up from every single person in the room. Uh, this is just one I have up, okay? So you'll see, this is what I would really encourage you to do in your coaching books, your notes on your phone, right on the back of your hand. That's your style. Have your, have your four phases laid out. Your ramp, your raise, activate, mobilize, and performance, right? And just put down five. This is one that I just copied and pasted from one of my things. And I know it's like, oh, take a picture of that. He must know what he's doing. That's, that's just a very simple one. Like, it's, it's not magic. Like, it's just running up and down the pitch. That's all it is. So my raise, I'm going to do some straight line running. I'm going to do some lateral shuffles. I'm going to run and then run at a higher intensity. I'm going to side shuffle in, I'm going to side shuffle out, and I'm going to increase the run intensity. And then going to have a little bit of running, like I told earlier, with that unknown change of direction. So players are coming towards me, left, right, blue, red, whatever it is. My activation then, I have some hamstrings into single leg deadlifts. I have some double leg calf raises. I have single leg calf raises with a quad pull. 
leg behind the glute activation, single leg glute bridges, all right? None of those exercises are any way better than anything else. It's just these are the ones that I went with. My mobility phase then, bird dog, spinal flexion, extension, hip rotation, world greatest stretch, pigeon stretch. And then for my performance, I'm looking at my team and I'm thinking, what do they need to do today? So they're going to sprint, but they're going to do it in different directions. So they're running out, they're backpedaling, sprinting at 60%. They're going to move laterally across the pitch. So they're going laterally in and out, 60% sprint. They're going to jump on two legs. So they'll jump on two legs and they'll sprint at 70%. They're going to jump on one leg and they're going to sprint at 80%. And then the last part then, unknown change of direction, getting sprinted at 90 to 100%. How do they really know what percentage they're actually running at anyway? So if you can take one thing from today as well, I would get into the habit of, get into your coaching book now tonight, draw out your four across, five down, put ramp across the top, come up with five warm-ups and just start implementing them. Neither of your warm-ups are going to be any better than the other. Mine is not better than yours. Nobody's is better. You know that kind of way? It doesn't really matter. Um, <coughs> just on that, sorry? I mean, mm -hmm. should you be trying to incorporate the warm-up into your warm-ups as many doors or just a few of those each into, you know, I mean, depending on what, like, trying to get all that into a warm-up you'd be there for a long time. Uh, that, that's actually a small warm-up. Like, literally, that straight line run is over and back to pitch. You do two, two laps of that your lateral shuffle over and back to pitch, do two laps of that. I'd get through that warm up in 12 minutes. What I would do, and it's very much, it depends. So it's great saying oh, 15 minutes to do the warm up today, but then you get a coach and you're like, no, no, sports psychologist is coming in today. I want him into the dressing room earlier. You have four minutes, go out and get it done. So you have to be able to adapt and overcome then on the pitch. And that's happened to me so many times. I'm coming in, I have my coach notebook. I think I'm the right man. And then he's like, no, you only have five minutes today. I need to get him in earlier. Something happened. And then what do I do? I have to scrap this and I have to kind of work on my feet. W what I would do when you're designing your warm-ups, and it's a really, and the reason I say write five of them is have five different warm-ups. So have a warm-up for when you train on Wednesday night. Have a warm-up for when you train on Tuesday night. Have a warm-up for competitions. Have a warm-up for when it's competitive and it's a day like today. Have a warm-up for when it's competitive and it's, hissing raining and it's freezing and your players are flogged okay that makes sense just start designing these warm-ups i'm going to show you a resource that you can use later and um, the same resource that i use for my warm-ups and you can start putting them together as long as those players buy into what you're doing and they move up and down the pitch for 10 to 15 minutes you kind of can't really do it wrong in my personal experience mm -hmm. yeah a bird dog. Oh, the practical demonstration time. <laughs> someone, someone put you up to that now. <laughs> a bird dog is a glute activation exercise where you basically go opposite hand, opposite leg. You come slow on the way in. Opposite hand, opposite leg. You come slow on the way in. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, Google it and see what happens. Yeah. Would you modify that warm up in any way for kids? Um, I would include more fun-based games. It depends, like, if, if it's kids, as in really, really young kids. Eight, 10 to 12, that kind of um, Not animal games then, but, like, start again. The, the why is really important then, remember, the buy-in. So th that's a tough age group to be saying, like, right, we're going to do activation work. We're going to do because they're like, what's he talking about? Like, I just want to play, you know, I just want to play football. So in encourage them to why you're doing it. You know, start telling them, so they're like, why are we doing this? You're never going to get injured again. You know, you're going to be faster. You're going to start jumping higher. You're going to be a better player. Start again, it all comes back to it. So would you need to adapt it for a younger age group? Probably not, unless it's a really young age group. But start actually telling them why you're doing it. Um, if you go to a really younger age group, you're going to start looking at, it's not a broad jump, it's a, it's a frog jump or whatnot, you know, make it a little bit interesting or you've lost them straight away. Um, oh, sorry, one more question. Yeah, yeah. Back and back. Well, with a large group of players, mm -hmm. you actually split them up to get the most effective use of the ladies. Like, you could have 20 kids, mm -hmm. so they're doing their straight one line in the back. Yeah. And then the next couple of kids. Is it more practical to actually break it into smaller groups and start to run it? You, you, you absolutely could, but, like, say, for me, 
I, I use the most basic warm up of all time and I've, I'll never change it, it just works. I'll just have my cones li lined up across the pitch and I could have 10 players in the front and I'll just have 10 players behind them and they'll just start moving. So like you can get a big group into a small space, you know what I mean? Even I've, I've done this style of warm up on the side, on sidelines, you know what I mean? You can still get moving. Um, are you saying nearly break up the sections? Kids, yeah. Kids mm -hmm. So you need to get a, a dynamic short. Exactly, yeah. And that's all, all the warm-ups that I'm trying to kind of preach today are dynamic. With kids at that age, what you need to do is you need to keep them moving as much as you can so they can't question you. So they, so they can't like be like, this is shit. You know, because they don't have a chance to even do that because they're moving, they're moving, they're moving. You know what I mean? What I'm not a fan of is right, this is what we're going to do next because you've already stopped them then, okay? When you're, when you're finishing your warm-up, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you mentioned it with the, the League of Ireland team, you're going back into the dressing room for a sports cycle mm -hmm. or whatever. Would you prefer just to go straight into the game? That you're literally jerseys on, warm-ups on? You need to time time it as much as you can. So there's no point in doing this performance thing and trying to get them up to that level and then the match starts in 25 minutes because they're starting to drop down again. So I would always have that chat if, if you're, maybe you're the coach and the fitness coach, so you can have a chat with yourself. You need to time that as close to the match as you can. I would always chat to say, right, what time's kickoff? What time do you want them back in the dressing room? And I'll give, I, I don't want them going back in the dressing room and sitting down and starting to relax because you're already starting to kind of migrate against what you've done here. You know, you've ramped them up and there was 20 minutes till the match and they're starting to drop back down again. So where possible, get it as close to the actual competition as you can. 15 minutes, even at training sessions, is that it? It can, be, it can be shorter, like 10 to 15 minutes. And it, you see, the answer to like nearly all these questions, and someone preached this to me years ago, is it's always, it depends. It depends on your own individual. Like, you could do a warm up in five minutes, and have, you know what I mean? It depends what you're about. If you're about to do a kind of light-hearted, fun type game activities, you just need to get moving a little bit. That's all you need to do. 10 to 15 is kind of the general consensus, yeah. Just to make sure you're giving each phase enough time. Uh, the next part I'm going to move on to, lads, so we'll leave a little bit of time at the end for the discussion, is the difference between readiness and preparedness, okay? So uh, someone asked me a question at a similar seminar like this before. It was like, when, when should I, similar to your question, when should I start the warm-up? Like, should I start it 20 minutes before the match? It's like ideally you should start to warm up the night before the game, okay? And he's like, oh, well, what do you mean? Like, so there's, there's a difference in here, right? We have readiness. So readiness is the current functional state of an athlete to perform. So we've ticked the box on readiness. They're ready. We've done the warm up, okay? But we've got our players ready via the warm up. We've ticked the box on readiness. Are they prepared? Okay. So a state of preparedness is a multi-dimensional state that's composed of a number of factors, okay? So leave readiness aside for the loan. We've already done that. We've done the warm-up. We've done everything we were meant to do. A state of preparedness begins well before our athletes go into a state of readiness in their warm-up. So look at the holistic approach. If my athlete didn't get eight hours sleep, they were up all night, newborn kid, whatever it is, the best warm-up in the world is not going to get that athlete up to the level of someone that had his eight hours sleep the night before. How's their stress? So physiologically, are they absolutely battered because they had six to seven training sessions that week? How's their psychological state? Do they have some sort of performance anxiety? They're stressed out over this particular match. They're you know, having stress in the camp. There's a little bit of conflict. So no matter how good your warm up is, if your players are coming in battered and they're stressed out up here, the best warm-up in the world is still not going to get that player where you need him. And then, maybe you're in the wrong room, you should be in there. <laughs> How's their nutrition? Okay, are they sufficiently fueled for performance? So if they don't have the right balance of uh, hydration, electrolytes, carbs and proteins, then again, you're, you're kind of warming up nearly just for the sake of it. All right? So... That's a big thing I'd like you to take from today as well is the difference between readiness and preparedness. So readiness is done via our warm-up. We all know how to do that now. 
but preparedness begins the night before the game okay maybe it begins a week before the game uh, I'll just touch kind of quickly on recovery when we look at recovery we want to think why what and how now I'll always get hit when I do warm-up stuff with what should we do after training and that's kind of an age-old question that science is not going to answer should we do static stretching when we finish should we bring all the players in together I personally when a manager used to ask me to take a group of players who had just got lumped and then take them out into the middle of the pitch and sit them down and do static stretching you feel like they want to choke you like you're like they just got bet they're they're in a bad mindset and you're bringing them out now and you know stretch they stretch the quads they couldn't care about stretching their quads and stuff like that so personally just for me i don't like the idea of that i don't like the idea after a game i think it's very individualized find out what works for you as a group so you, whether you've won or lost maybe you don't do any stretching maybe you just come together as a group you have a little chat you have a little debrief the heart rate will start to come down anyway you've ticked the box on your cool down or maybe you don't come together maybe you're the type of manager who just likes to right you know we'll debrief we'll meet again monday night so a little bit then on recovery all right so the why of recovery what we want to do is we want to reduce that mental stress so whether we lost the game or we won the game we're going to be accumulating a little bit of mental stress we want to reduce our muscular fatigue and regenerate so we're going to be battered after the game we want to come back so that we're okay tomorrow and we want to adapt to what happened in the game so we want to get better and then we want to think longevity so basically our injury reduction long term the what of recovery so what are we actually trying to do when we use these recovery strategies and whatnot? Physiologically, we're trying to increase our blood flow and our nutrient delivery to our muscles. So we're just repairing. In terms of nutrition then, we want to rehydrate, we want to reduce inflammation, we want to get our carbs and our proteins in. Neuromuscularly then, maybe we want to get our DOMS down, we want to reduce that pain perception. And then in a mental then, we want to get the mood up, stress down, and our stress hormones down. The what, how of recovery. So this again is so, it depends. The jury is out on all of these different types of methods, be it cryotherapy, compression garments, whatnot. We want to recover physically. We might be hitting some kind of cold water treatment, contrast showers, uh, cold water immersion. Nutrition then, carbs, proteins, and hydration, again. You picked the wrong room if you want to talk to me about nutrition. Uh, neuromuscular then, we want to maybe do deep tissue massage, foam rolling, compression garments, active recovery. And then in terms of our mental state, number one, we need to sleep, get out and socialize, get back to our normal lives. Music, reading, very, very individual and all that kind of stuff. Okay. When I talked earlier about resources, right? So it, it's very easy for me to say, Oh, the ramp method is easy to follow and it's easy to put together a warm up. I have, I've, I've done, I'm into my seventh year in a sports science background, but it actually is. And, and I remember putting together these warm ups when I was only working as an intern and when I was only in my first year in college. And one of, one of the best resources is a website called Science for Sport. Okay, if you hit Science for Sport and go into their article on warm ups, it'll give you a breakdown of everything i've talked about today and like of course you're going to forget some of the things i said listening to me blabble on today but if you can read through that individually i think that's one of the best resources for coaches out there and it's free they don't charge you can subscribe to a higher level but everything is there so science for sport the, if you want to go really into it ian jeffries wrote the book on ramp okay you can get that book for about 20 quid on amazon you don't need to if, if you're that type of person and you want to go a little bit further on it. Uh, my own Instagram, I can't say that I'm, I'm really good on social media. I, I don't post a lot because I'm too busy, but I do try sometimes put up articles and whatnot that, that might help. Um, and a really good podcast, if podcast, if anyone's jam, is uh, the Pacey Performance Podcast. There's tons and tons and tons of podcast done with Rob Pacey on basically just injury prevention, warm-ups, strength and conditioning, nutrition, everything. And podcasts for me are very easy because you're 
we live like everybody in this room makes long journeys somehow for training or, or, or competition so get the podcast on in the car if if you don't bother with any of those go on to science for sport tonight and just look at their website it's absolutely phenomenal the stuff they've actually put together for free um you'll get everything i said today in a nice little downloadable book that you can use and uh that's everything that we'll move into discussion Oh yeah, the last slide was it? Yeah. Again, these here, signs for sport, they're all there. You know, coaches, the art of coaching is stealing things from other people. Don't let anyone else tell you that it's not. That's what we do. We take things from others. I didn't write the book on warm-ups. Ian Jeffrey wrote the book on warm-ups, but he probably stole it from some Eastern Bloc coach. Get onto these websites, take the resources, take what other people are doing. That's the only way you get better as a coach. <coughs> yeah. yeah, it's good. It's, it's very similar to the FIFA 11 and whatnot. Mm -hmm. it's, if you look at that carefully, so do you have the booklet even for that? If you go look at that and, and take out ramp and put it right next to it, it's the same thing. They're, they're all following that kind of universally. That's what research is trying to do. They're trying to kind of universally bring about these warm-ups. And they're really, really good ones that, that follow that kind of ramp method, really. In the, in the media, mm -hmm. a lot in the last couple of years, and in particular the GA players, you have an awful lot of young, young lads having to resort with deep injuries. The, the FAI, the femoral arterial impingement scandal in GAA, they're saying is going to be as big as concussion was in, in American football. And it's sim there's that's we're going down a rabbit hole if we start talking about that. There's a that's a multi-dimensional thing. There's a lot going on there. It's the lack of qualified strength and conditioning coaches from an early age. It's too late when we're twenties. It's the the demands of the sport. You're playing on two different teams. You're playing with your college, you know, there's a lot that comes down to that with the hip injury thing. If we start talking about that, we'll go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> Any other questions, Les? Yeah. Um, the warm down, uh, which is what you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at the school talks that the warm down is just as important as a, as a warm up mm -hmm. after match. Yeah. Um, so. In terms of just uh, ensuring that there's no. Uh, I, I know the science behind it as in Mm -hmm. The science behind science squash so in that it reduces now force squash output, that it reduces okay, so um, it doesn't help injury reduction. It still it still should be dynamic. So if I am doing a cool down, I will still get the players moving a little bit. What I think about static stretching and whatnot, and I'll tell you in a second why none of this matters anyway, is if if I could actually change the length of my hamstring right now by just putting that little bit of pressure on it. Right? If my hamstring was that fickle, what would happen if someone hit me with like a tackle? Like I'd break in half. If if that's how fickle my muscle actually is, that I can just stretch that out there now, or it's gonna change the length of my shoulder now by pulling it across my body. What would happen if I got hit by a car? Like I'd literally evaporate. You know, our our bodies are, are very, very robust and that's why static stretching is getting a little bit of a you know, wasting your time kind of thing. But if that's what your players love doing, when you finish training and they love coming together and doing their stretches, then have at it. it, it science is great and it kind of guides what we do, but it shouldn't dictate what you do. And that's why I say, I always like to have a little bit of a method, and it's whatever the coach's method is, I'm only the, the messenger boy of, of what do we do after training. So we're, we're in the habit of just naturally saying, oh, we'll come in now in a circle and we'll start stretching, but like, for me, thinking back when I used to play sport, like if I've just had a shit performance, I used to play on goal in soccer, like, and I just fumble the ball into the net, and then I'm there after the thing, all I want to do is get out of there, like, and, and I'm, I'm having to go over then now and be told to stretch my, you know, stretch my calves, stretch my quads. Like, it, it can put players into a little bit of a negative mindset. Happy enough? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it could be a good 
Mm -hmm. It's a great debris. It's a great, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I think in the past I've I've not enjoyed doing that is because the coach would send me off as the S and C coach to to we with the players, but I can't provide the debrief. You know, I'm I'm not the coach. You'd ideally want your head coach or your manager doing the debrief because they they're the ones then that can do their few stretches, but also talk about how the game went. I I think I don't know what anyone's opinion on it is, but talking about your performance the minute you finish is probably the wrong time to do it because you're too emotional. You're, you're fatigued physically, you're fatigued mentally, and you're very emotional. It, it's better to nearly leave it a little bit. I'm not saying like, oh, come back next week, we talk about it, but that, that's my personal you know, experience on that. Coach, you mentioned earlier four sessions, three sessions in the match we get. That's, that's probably at a higher level, but quite mm -hmm. a Yeah. Yeah, and if you look at it like so, and I'm not even going to attempt to do the maths because I'm terrible at it. But if we go back to that first slide, um, where we talked about the 12 hours of training time, so you said that's at a high level. We're talking four times a week. But even if it is only twice or once a week, it's still a lot of learning opportunities. Maybe you're working with a younger athletes and you only have them once a week. So you only get 15 minutes per week. But within a month then, that's an hour. So that, that's an hours of warming up and training and injury prevention and making them a little bit faster and whatnot that you can do. So that, that's, mm -hmm. so, so I, I don't know if it's relevant to this. No, no, everything How is. Many hours do you reckon then a 14, 13, 14, 15 year old girl or boy training a week? should do or is too much or where do you again going down a rabbit hole if we talk about that um see it, it's very, how do you control that so like it's very like all you have to do is look up the position statements from from the scientific community on this and here's what they should be doing but that's not what they are doing you know t you know maybe they're doing too little maybe they're doing too much somewhere that like if a 13 year old should do no more than 13 hours mm. In that travel time, they're 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 undergoing a little bit of stress. You know, it's the stress of actually having to travel. It's it's the stress, the physical stress of sitting in the car. That's why, like, the whole thing around like your overtraining syndrome is what you're getting at. It's it's a holistic model. There's a hundred and one thousand different things that impact that lead to burnout or hip injuries or, or what there's there's a lot that comes into that. Where, where, where can I get that kind of Ideally you speak to a really good physio. Um, look up injury position statements. There's there's a lot more being done in Ireland now, especially in, in Gaelic football and whatnot, with really good research. The unfortunate part if you go to look up something like that, um, you're you're going to probably find a model from New Zealand or something like that, you know, we're, we're a little bit behind in that, trying to put that information out there, but it all does apply at the end of the day. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. oh, see, that's, that's the thing, it's, it's the better you are, the more exposure you actually have to your training stimulus then, so you're starting to get really good and, and you're, you know, you're, you're playing on this team and all of a sudden then you get bumped up a little bit higher level and then you're on the college team and whatnot and that's where it starts to get a little bit messy like but that's i'm absolutely not an expert in the logistics behind that so i'm not you know it's not for me to say oh of course yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah and exactly yeah and it's it's mad because there's a lecturer on WIT, Laura Finnegan, she specialises in this and she talks about how the multi-sport athlete is the one who lasts longer in sport. So it is the player who's playing a bit of hurling, he's doing a bit of swimming, maybe he's doing gymnastics, whatever. But how do you, how do you balance all that then? Like, how do you try to balance that? You know, you want him on this night, but he's meant to be doing that on that night and it does, it does get tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that's that's like when when you say come together, like that's the goal of these things. Is is, is like, you know, I I'm just telling you about this stuff, but you'll probably learn more from just talking to the people in this room than you learn from listening to that there. Just about on what they do and what how many times they train per week, you know. So like use today definitely as a learning opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, like that that'll for for me, who oh, I, I I'm not no much of a clue. I'll rather not, but like if a coach tells me use the ball, use the hurley, absolutely, why not, sure, and especially when I was working with the Camogie team, they, they love holding the hurley when they're sprinting, I don't know, is it a thing that they just grip and rip and they go, but like they, they love that, so, and if they love it, let them do it, don't stand there and say no, no, no balls, no hurleys, you know what I mean, let them do it. Back to me, I think we could be here for another hour. Um, Jay is staying around for a while, so if you do pass him and you, you want to ask him an individual question, feel free to ask him. But uh, I think uh, that was a fantastic um, presentation. Thanks, man. It's hugely informative, and like, as I said, um, really, really good stuff there for everybody. And uh, I hope there's a, a lot of take home messages in it. And um, once again, Jay, cheers. Thanks very Thanks much. Thanks, Major Doctor. And enjoy the rest of the, the conference. Thank you. Thank you.